Hello and welcome to the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. I'm Chuck DeGroat, Professor of Pastoral Care and Counseling at Western Theological Seminary and Senior Fellow at Newbigin House of Studies. Today we are in conversation with Marilyn McIntyre, writer and professor of medical humanities at the UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program. Jeff Monroe sat down with Marilyn as she shared how to play with a poem. I wanted to talk with Marilyn today about, particularly about this chapter on poetry. How to, how to, I'm reading over your shoulder. How to play with a poem. How to play with a poem. So tell us how to play with a poem. Okay. One of the chapters in the book, as you know, is about play. Mm -hmm. And I was reintroduced to play in the early years of teaching when someone gave me Stephen Nachmanovich's book, Free Play, The Power of Improvisation in Life and Art. And both he and Maria Montessori reframe work as play, and that the highest kind of work is play, and that play is a sacred practice, mm -hmm. because it means being in the moment and expecting the spirit to show up mm -hmm. and being willing to move with that. So I put together these 10 ways to play with a poem. First one is find a path through it. And I just, when we read a poem, I just ask people to, to depending on the length of the poem, choose five words or 10 words, whatever, that are, make a path. Read it vertically and find five favorite words. Mm. Write them down over here, see what you have. And it's curious how often if people just read their five words out loud, that already seems like the spine of a new poem. Mm. So that practice of collecting words helps you, I think, listen to people who are speaking and pick up their key words and then you begin to notice patterns of thought. Uh, it's like tracing a stream. The path also gives you a sense of direction through the poem. That's your path through the forest. And there are other paths. I did this the other day with Ted Olson's little poem, Hawk's Way, which is short enough, so I'm going to read it, if I may. And then just say some of the ways people em a path emerged in this poem. This was the perilous, lovely way the hawk fell down the long hill of wind, the anarch air shaped by his going, air become visible, bent to a blade of beauty, cruel and taut and bare, a bow of ecstasy, singing and insolent. Such a great word to end on. But so if you go through and you pick perilous, anarch, visible, blade, ecstasy, insolent. You just have the shape of the poem and you have the movement from that lovely opening oxymoron, perilous and lovely, to singing and insolent, which is another oxymoron at the end. And I feel as though one of the things you learn to do when you practice poetry is honor the complexity of things, that we're always in paradox. Mm. Jesus teaches in paradox. Mm. Every wisdom tradition all the Hasidic tales bring you back to paradox. So that finding a path, I think, is one practice that's good. It's also very subjective. A lot of these practices remind me of Lectio Divina, which is that practice of listening for a word or phrase as you read scripture, and not for an idea, and not for a claim or a proposition or a sentence, just a word or a phrase that summons you. Another is taste the words, pick your favorites, consider why those words appeal to you. Some years ago, I collected a group of essays by 35 writers and called it word tastings. And they just got to write five to seven pages about a favorite word. Mm. It was a very oddball collection of words. Mm. But I did one on dwell, and I loved dwelling with that word. So to pause over a word in a poem and consider its resonance and why it appeals to you and then go to its etymology, where does it come from, what other words does it connect to, is again to just move in toward a center rather than moving on. So part of poetry is, as opposed to narrative, is to drop in rather than go on. Mm -hmm. Narrative says, and then, and then, and then. The po poems make you stop. You should pause. Right. Yes. Poems slow you down. And every good poem has an undertow that will take you back toward the beginning. So you can't just move on. You get to a point where you go, oh, yeah, huh, I heard that before. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, another of the ways to play with a poem is just look for surprises. Um, I had this English teacher friend who reminded his students, and this is a quote, he said, whatever is odd, confusing, incongruous, or boring is probably interesting <laughs> and important. And so you just look for what's odd, incongruous, confusing, or boring. Mm. Like, what's that word doing in there? Mm. So the surprises could even be annoying surprises. I mm. wish the poem didn't have this word in it. And then go, go there wherever it surprises you and mm. think, what was that about? Mm. It makes me think of um, Tim Brown, our president, in preaching, he'll say, or in, in, in preparing to preach, in reading the scripture, he'll say, find the point of resistance, and then th yeah. that's the point where you need to work. Yeah. There's a reason why that caused that in you. Right. Yeah. That's right. a good point. Another one is trace its topography, which is to think of the poem as a map. Mm -hmm. And what is being mapped here, I think that question opens up the visible character of the poem. Where do we start? Where do we end? How do we get there? What's the shape? So if you hold on to that analogy, you kind of see the peaks and the valleys and the thickets. I think of the topo maps that people use when they're hiking. And poems have places of density and places where they thin out. Mm. So that's something to play with. Let it make music. I think the process, even in a non-metrical poem, of putting it to music, humming it, humming it, will give you a sense of its dimension and the, and the musical dimension of language. One of the exercises I've done in poetry courses often is to distribute a poem in German, a poem in Spanish, and a poem in French, because I can read those languages. And, only the, and then we read them out loud, or I read them out loud. And only the people who don't know the language are, are allowed to talk about the poem. <laughs> and the point is to find out how much information you can actually get about the tonality of a poem, about what it may be about without knowing the, quote, content. So that's a way of just playing mm -hmm. with the musicality, the cadence, the vowel and consonant sounds. And then ask it questions is probably the core process. I always remind people there are six question words, who, what, when, where, how, and why. So start in with them. Who wrote this? Who's speaking? From what vantage point? How does it work? Why might the writer have done that in that way? Why would, the end, why would the line end here? And not ask these in frustration or as rhetorical questions, but think, yeah, why might the line end here? I don't quite get it, but what are some possibilities? And isn't, isn't how, did, how is this poem working? Or yes. a better question in some ways than what is this supposed to mean? Oh, yeah. What does the poem mean is one question to just hang up because it doesn't take you anywhere. It yeah. assumes that there's one meaning. It assumes that your job is to decode the poem and then be done with it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that good poetry reminds you is that meaning is always negotiated in a living moment. And when we talk about the Bible as a living word, I think there's a way we can claim literary tradition as the living conversation that a culture has with itself. So when you read a poem, you're engaging with a spirit a speaker in that broad communion of saints who says, who summons you and says, come, let's have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so the question asking is to say, how does this poem enter into this moment? What gift does it bring to the, this moment historically? Another is treat it like a dream. I've done a lot of dream work and I highly recommend a book by Jeremy Taylor, not the philosopher, but a contemporary psychologist called dream work where he gives you 17 ways to work with a dream mm. but he insists that even if all you have is a little shred of a dream if you work with it it will give you information mm. and I think that's true of a poem too if you kind of don't get it but there's something there that's intriguing if you just go there and tug on that string it will yield something um, and then test it against prose. This is where I just say, okay, beat it into prose, you know, paraphrase it. Just make it as flat as you can. It's okay, go, do, go ahead and do that. You get so many students who say, well, what Shakespeare was really trying to say, which just makes me crazy. 
I think Shakespeare wasn't trying to say it. He said it. You are trying to understand it. But, but the process of paraphrasing can be very rich. And one of the sweetest experiences I had with one of our sons was when he was a sophomore in high school and they had to read Hamlet. And he sat down with me and he said, I just want to get this. Would you just go through it line by line? And then he wouldn't let me move on to the next line until he really got it. Mm. So we just paraphrased. We spent hours doing that. And it well, was close delightful. Yeah. 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 And then number nine is make a bouquet. Put it in the context of other poems. What does this poem remind me of? Mm. You know, when I read Oliver, how does she make me think of Emily Dickinson? Or when I read um, Hopkins, how does he make me think of John Donne? Mm -hmm. But just sort of connecting the poets in the conversation as, as you have encountered them. Yeah, and that, that the this, hawk poem we were just talking about, that, that hawk poem makes me think of a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, The Windhover. Yes. And then there's also a, a hawk poem that you'd quoted in the previous chapter by Mary Oliver. Right. So you can put them together. Well, I had a student one year who did her paper on a series of spider poems because mm. we read one poem by Whitman about a spider, and then it turned out Emily Dickinson had a poem about a spider, and then Jonathan Edwards had his spider dangling over the pit of hell which then became a reference point, and then she looked at a Robert Lowell poem about a spider, and it turned out to be really a delightful exploration of the spider image and how it has resonated. And then the last one is Let It Be a Mirror. Mm -hmm. Why this poem at this time? What is it about me? What did I need that I found here? Mm -hmm. So taking stock of the gift. One of the things I've said so often in classes that people started making a joke out of it, was, what do you have to do to get the gift that's being offered? What do you have to forgive a writer in order to receive what they give you? You might have to forgive Joyce his obtuseness in order, order to get the gift yeah. of Finnegan, Finnegan's Wake. Yeah. Right. But I think where is the gift for me is to come back to this subjectivity that's totally permitted. The sad thing about reading poems in classrooms rather than in community settings so often is that people, they become encased in assignments. But in fact, I think they're meant to just be floated out into the common pool of awareness and knowledge mm -hmm. and let people say, oh, this one's for me, thank you. Mm. Yeah, so the last thing in here is if it has wisdom to offer you, remember to say thank you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Well, that's really helpful, Marilyn. There you go. Everything you need <laughs> to, to be able to play with a poem right there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to learn more, check out Marilyn's books, Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies, and What's in a Phrase, Pausing Where Scripture Gives You Pause.